So we've been looking at ecosystem-based adaptation. It's also referred to as natural climate solutions, nature-based climate solutions, and so on. So I'm taking a few additional points on this idea of ecosystem-based adaptation, but now uh, it's called adaptation measures for biodiversity. Just a quick run through some few points without going into too many details. So we'll run through a couple of uh, tables. So this is table 2.6 from IPCC AR6 report. Uh, I think it's working group 3 called Impacts, Vulnerability and Adaptation. Evidence to support proposed climate change adaptation measures for biodiversity. The evidence highlights that adaptation for biodiversity conser conservation is a broad concept encompassing a wide range of actions. It includes targeted interventions to change the microclimate for particular species such as by creating shade, to changing national conservation objectives to take account of changing distribution of species and communities. So you can worry about one little species all the way to ecosystems and national scale uh, land cover. It includes targeted actions addressing both climate change and the protection and restoration of ecosystems with multiple additional benefits including reduced vulnerability to climate change and health is a big uh, co-benefit of biodiversity conservation and adaptation measures for biodiversity as well. Most of the studies are not direct tests of the impacts of adaptation actions which as noted above, which we didn't read, is an important uh, gap in the evidence. There is also a major limitation in that reported studies are predominantly from Europe, North America and Australia with little research done in other regions. This becomes important of course because the biodiversity itself is different in tropical countries and the issues to deal with in conserving them or doing adaptation for biodiversity is going to be a very different ball, uh, ball game in the uh, global south. Okay, so quickly proposed adaptation measures for biodiversity, uncertainty assessment, comment and references. Protect large areas of natural and semi-natural habitat. Robust evidence of high agreement uh, exists uh, for uh, uncertainty assessment. There is considerable evidence that intact systems provide better quality and quantity of ecosystem services, which you know has a definition, food, fiber, medicine, cultural value. Uh, health, well-being, etc. Large intact areas provide better ecosystem services because fractionated ecosystems tend to uh, create habitat loss and connectivity loss for many species. The risk of species extinction from disturbances including climate change is reduced by having large connected populations. More biodiverse systems provide higher levels of ecosystem services and are more resilient to climate change than degraded systems that have lost species. So resilience is always an outcome, desired outcome at least, or should be planned outcome for uh, of adaptation. Increase connectivity in terrestrial habitats, corridors and stepping stones, uh, medium evidence, medium agreement. There is good evidence that some species move more quickly in uh, more connected uh, landscapes. However, not all species do and some of those that benefit are invasive pest disease species. To date, empirical evidence showing that connectivity has reduced climate change impacts on species is limited. So we are talking about issues that have some evidence but uh, it's also possible that the connectivities benefit invasive uh, species or pests and diseases. And this apparently played out in the wildfires in Hawaii, for example. Uh, it was quite destructive and amazingly uh, large in duration and intensity and it apparently was uh, due to invasive species as well. Increase connectivity in river networks, so there is limited evidence but high agreement of the, among the studies. Connectivity is needed to maintain the improvement, the movement of species and populations but river reaches and catchments lack integrated protection. So there is a lot of uh, work on how dams affect biodiversity upstream and downstream, for example. 
So that's kind of indirectly related to connectivity in river networks as well. Increased salmon uh, have been s suffering in northwest US, for example, because of uh, too many dams being built on the Columbia River and so on. Increased habitat patch size and expand protected areas, again limited evidence but high agreement, generally increases resilience because of functioning natural processes, large species populations and refugial areas. Refugia are basically uh, regional loopholes, you, you can say, where there may be warming happening around and there is a little refugia that provides some escape or protection for some species and refugia are created by various processes that uh, I have discussed elsewhere. You can look up on my uh, channel. Okay, Increase uh, replication and representation of protected areas, again limited evidence but high agreement. Various benefits inferred including a wider range of climatic and other conditions and less risk of extreme events affecting many rather than few areas. Uh, more sites available for colonization by range expanding species and better conditions to maintain species in situ under range contraction. So all kinds of interactions with uh, multiple species. Protect microclimatic refugia, so medium evidence and high agreement. Locally cool areas can be identified and there is evidence that species can survive better in such areas. So this also has been reported for uh, some penguins in the Galapagos region where under global warming the winds have changed in a way that locally some upwelling increase has occurred and penguins have actually uh, grown in number but some have argued that that may be because of uh, getting rid of the rodents that were uh, affecting the penguins. Okay, So there are many more such examples. Uh, do I want to read all of them? Uh, let's do that. Creating shade to lower temperatures for vulnerable species, restoring hydrological processes of wetlands, rivers, catchments, uh, including by raising water, water tables and restoring original channels of water courses, restoration of natural vegetation dynamics, reduce non-climatic stressors to increase resilience of ecosystems. So this as a general principle, climate change is recognized as a threat multiplier, by, uh, but specific details are often unclear. Okay. Uh, assisted translocation and migration of species, intensive management for specific species, ex situ as opposed to in situ conservation, so things like seed banks, genetic stores, etc. Adjusting conservation strategies and site objectives to reflect changing species distributions and habitat characteristics and softening the matrix of unsuitable habitats between patches to increase permeability for the movement of species in response to climate change. This, for example, there's potential for uh, agri-environment schemes to do this in hostile uh, farmed landscapes. Okay, Lots of good papers are cited here that you can follow up if you're interested in this. Examples of key ecosystem-based adaptation measures with assessments of confidence. Not only adaptation-related services are shown, many measures also provide a range of other benefits, what we refer to as co-benefits, to people all also provide benefits for biodiversity. Okay, EBA measures, I won't read all these details, so let's look at one or two examples. Uh, Ecosystem-based adaptation measures, natural flood risk management in river systems, restoring natural river courses, so removing canalization, which is done extensively for supplying water to agricultural lands and so on, restoring or drinking water, restoring and protecting wetlands and riparian vegetation, so here, uh, flood regulation, sediment retention, water storage, water purification, etc., with climate change impact b uh, addressed being increased rainfall intensity, and social benefits are uh, reduction of flood damage, increased water security in terms of quality and supply, and other relevant uh, impacts and uh, relevant ecosystems and contexts are multiple with these papers being the sources of this conclusion. Shade rivers and streams by restoration of riparian vegetation trees. This provides uh, fish stocks for example and acts as uh, a, a, a adaptation against warmer water temperatures, uh, can help food security income benefits. 
managed al realignment of coastlines, re-establishing and protecting coastal habitats, including mangroves, salt marshes, coral reefs, and oyster reefs. Can be useful for dealing with sea level rise. Um, agroforestry and other agroecological conservation practices on agricultural land. I've discussed this uh, in the course called Drawdown, uh, where we have looked at uh, nature-based solutions as well and also in other courses. Okay, Restore and maintain urban and peri-urban green space, trees, parks, local nature reserves and created wetlands. Ecological restoration for reducing fire risk by restoring natural vegetation and herbivory and reinstating natural fire regimes. Invasive non-native aquatic plant control to improve water security. Woody plant control of encroaching biomass in open grassy ecosystems to restore and maintain grassy vegetation. This is discussed elsewhere as well. Okay. Uh, furthermore, rangeland rehabilitation and management, uh, for example, introducing livestock enclosures, appropriate grazing management, reintroducing native grassland species, and so on. We have also discussed under drawdown the uh, various grazing methods uh, for being more sustainable in uh, dealing with cattle, which are highly environmentally uh, impactful in producing each calorie of uh, food meat beef is the most environmentally uh, expensive calorie you can get okay sustainable forestry of biodiverse managed forests uh, maintaining forest cover and protecting soils watershed reforestation and conservation of for hydrological services multifunctional forest management uh, and conservation to provide climate resilient sources of food and livelihoods and protect water resources uh, slope re, uh, revegetation for landslide prevention and erosion control, which is an incredibly good ecosystem-based uh, adaptation for uh, regions like the Himalayan slopes or Western Ghats and so on, which are having extreme rainfall and landslides, which, uh, you know, obviously there has been some carelessness in the way uh, things have been built, but the rainfall rates have also been unexpectedly high, which is not directly related to uh, local uh, emissions. It's a global problem. So how do we assign blame is not always uh, clear. Okay. Uh, looking at adaptation measures to reduce risks of ecosystem mediated diseases under climate change, very dense table, but we are looking at pathogens uh, host vector distributions and abundance, pathogen host transmission cycle occurrence and efficiency, likelihood of transmission to humans, so uh, zoonotic uh, diseases for example, evidence uh, low to high, so those are shown in these uh, bar diagrams on the, on the left, and agreement being low to high with these plus signs, so lots of dense information there. But let's look at the adaptation measure uh, and the, the description of adaptation options. So warning systems, diagnostic abilities, capacity building, public policy, financing, technology, management, infrastructure, nature-based solutions, change in changes in practices and co-benefits from uh, mitigation. So what are the uh, adaptation options and what are the climate impacts uh, we are hedging against. So build and maintain early surveillance system for pathogens affecting humans, wildlife and farm animals. So we are here covering multiple adaptation topics we have covered like health, water, uh, ecosystems and biodiversity and so on. Okay, establish seasonal and dynamical dynamic forecasts for uh, of disease outbreaks with detailed risk mapping. Create early warning systems targeted to the appropriate scale, uh, local, regional, and international. Okay, so I won't read all of these. For example, here changes in practices, diversify diets, create more resilient food systems. Not very easy because often behavioral changes are needed and how to induce behavioral change. How to get people who are so used to eating meat or fish to become vegetarians. That's not so easy. There are also cultural practices involved, 
Japanese want to hunt whales, Norwegians want to hunt whales. You think it's so obvious that they would stop, but it's not so obvious because these are claimed to be cultural heritages and so on. Reduce the wildlife trade, which seems like a no-brainer, but still it uh, is not so easy to implement. Decrease reliance on bushmeat and wild animal products. Bushmeat gets smuggled not only within Africa, but all the way into the US and so on. So this can affect things like uh, pathogen host transmission cycle occurrence and efficiency and uh, likelihood of transmission to humans, which is well known in terms of many jumps like Ebola and maybe even other diseases like HIV and so on and so forth. Of course, COVID also came from animals to humans. Co-benefits from mitigation, reductions in local emissions from energy systems, promotion of clean transport systems, improved access to food, water and energy, and can have climate impact in terms of pathogen host vector distribution and abundance, pathogen host transmission cycle occurrences and efficiency, and likelihood of transmission to humans as well. And we have medium confidence here uh, with agreement being medium as well. Okay, so I will leave this very brief podcast uh, here and just wanted to add it as an additional uh, point to the ecosystem-based adaptation that we have been discussing from the UN report. Okay.